My name is Nina Fernando, and I'm the program director of the Shoulder to Shoulder Campaign. I'm Reverend Rachel Tabor Hamilton, the rector of Trinity Episcopal Church in Everett, Washington, and I'm the coordinator for our Diocesan Ethnic Ministries Circles of Color, which is a, a networking of our different ethnic ministries and communities. My name is Anila Afzali, and I am the executive director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, MAPS Amen. We at, we at Jennifer Bearskin Sista, Stahopchen, Alupchen, Bedat Shuaklim. Hello, my name is Jennifer Bearskin. I am Sto I am Snohomish and uh, I am Alup. I am the youngest daughter of the sea monster man. an accomplice, being in solidarity, it's a it's a constant practice. So so what you said about um, authentic allyship being a practice that that is just that it means that it requires intention and, and constant reflection. And and it also means we're going to get it wrong sometimes. And that is okay. Unfortunately, I, I have experienced that as well. Uh, you know, we, we say um, intentions are great, uh, but uh, impact is greater than intention. Uh, and I've been able to see exactly why that phrase matters so much, because sometimes our friends and our allies, even those who are the most well-intentioned, can actually say or do things that actually harm or hurt the cause and the community rather than helping. Uh, and I see this most uh, often uh, through messaging, uh, uh, specifically uh, people repeating the talking points, the phrases, the well-researched phrases, I should add, uh, well-researched to make sure they're the most effective in promoting hate and bigotry, uh, repeating those phrases, giving more airtime uh, to those kinds of phrases and stereotypes rather than doing and saying the things that actually help according to psychological studies and messaging studies. So when, when allies, for instance, repeat negative stereotypes Types about Islam or Muslims, um, even if they are saying it in the negative form that Muslims are not this or Islam does not do this, and they repeat the negative terminology uh, the phrases uh, or the stereotype, what they're actually doing in people's minds is uh, psychologically, they are actually reinforcing that negative stereotype by again, um, uh, linking the, the word Muslim or Islam with that negative uh, word or stereotype or phrase. So I've seen that happen a lot, even by some of the best leaders, best allies out there. Uh, and even Muslims themselves at times will even do this and then repeat again, those negative uh, terms terms, phrases, uh, and stereotypes. Um, and I saw that specifically, I remember with the, uh, the anti-Muslim hate rallies in 2017, where so many people, again, of all different backgrounds came together to stand in solidarity with Muslims. Uh, and part of what they wanted to do, uh, I remember talking and, and really emphasizing this point that if you're here to stand in solidarity with Muslims, you have to to listen to Muslims and follow the lead of Muslims, because oftentimes people out of their their um, their you know desire to help or do something, uh, they might promote messaging that could actually hurt the community and the cause. And I said directly to them at that time to our group of organizers, I said, look, if if you are here to stand with Muslims in solidarity, then you have to put the community and the cause ahead of our own egos and emotions. Uh, and it, it was specifically a, a quote that I sort of came up with at that time and I've used ever since because it's a powerful reminder that we have to listen to the most directly impacted uh, when we show up as allies. Uh, because as I mentioned then, a lot of people who were there standing in solidarity with us, showing up in solidarity, they get to leave after that incident, you know, that hate rally, for instance, or whatever the occasion may be, they get to leave and go home and live their life. And the consequences, whether it's the media portrayals, whether it's the uh, blowback or anything else, it's going to be felt by those directly impacted. So in that specific situation, for instance, it was critical that we maintain positive messaging. And that's why we specifically created signs that said we stand with our Muslim neighbors instead of a lot of other negative messaging that could have attacked the haters that could have attacked, you know, the, that could have repeated the stereotypes, the misinformation, and could have done all of that. And the reason for that is we wanted, we knew that the media is not always fair 
to black and brown communities, including Muslims, and any any sort of negativity, any kind of a negative action, any kind of uh, sort of negative messaging, it would blow back and hurt the Muslim community. And we wanted as much as possible to try to stay positive in our messaging and in our actions. And we even put up a Ask a Muslim booth. And I remember being there, answering questions and talking to even some of the haters. Uh, and there was a specific reason and purpose for that. But those are the instances where I've literally seen people um, stand in solidarity, want to be allies, want to uh, think uh, do something that they think is effective in helping the cause when it could actually be hurting it. Uh, and, and a part of it also comes from a lack of education about the community. So for instance, or, or about the cause. So for instance, you know, there were people there who might not have realized when they were answering questions from various media or on social media, they were making certain statements that actually um, uh, was hurt the cause. So for instance, some people were saying, you know, I, I, I stand with Muslims, but I don't support Sharia, not even knowing what they're saying, which when they say when they make that statement, they are essentially saying, I, I stand with Muslims, but I don't think Muslims should have the same rights as all other Americans to practice their religion in our country that they didn't know that that's what they were saying, but they were saying that again, because of a lack of knowledge of the community that is directly impacted or the cause. So those are the instances that I've witnessed folks um, saying or doing things that while well-intentioned uh, could actually hurt the community or the cause. There was a time when uh, there was a group of us indigenous leaders who were working on a government to government um, communication action. And it actually was with our governor, Jay Inslee. And he was very gracious enough to take some time out of his busy moment while he was in, um, in his fundraiser to step aside and provide a private audience to our indigenous leaders and elders. What ended up happening which caused great harm and damage to the relationships, the government to government relationship was when we had a white allied woman who interrupted Jay Inslee, Governor Jay Inslee, um, very rudely and had told him to face all of the indigenous people. That was not her place to address him or to assume he was causing us any disrespect because he was following the protocol and he was providing us a face-to-face -face interaction, but this ended up cutting the meeting short. She also overspoke over some of our elders, which is, is a high offense. And it damaged, I feel, some of the government to government relationships some of us had actually left that group because we did not feel that that group was following our protocol because there was too many too much of of the white allyship that had taken over and it was no longer considered indigenous led and so many of us had left that particular group and we are hoping to repair our relations with him because he had kept his promise, which was to provide us one private conversation. And we had promised those of us who follow protocol that we were going to leave without disrupting his event any further. Unfortunately, some of the white allies and the rest ended up causing a huge disruption and it was just, it was an embarrassment and it was disrespectful and it really damaged um, a very delicate government to government relationship that we as tribes and indigenous people try to maintain with our current government system. And so our goal is to, for some of us that had left in a good way, have been wanting to work on our repairs with him because that that caused a huge setback in our in our efforts as as a relationship because honestly tribal government and US government have to work together for us um, to thrive and they damage that severely 
uh, so uh, we've had recently a lot of Black Lives Matter action and standing in public with our African American and Black American colleagues. And when they have invited us and we have gone and do, done exactly as they have asked, I think that's worked very well and they've experienced that support positively. Uh, recently, there was a series of emails that were flying back and forth and trying to uh, organize a particular action for Black Lives Matter when uh, one of these well-intentioned uh, white ladies, right, started to really try to be overly directive and uh, became very patronizing and said, you know, I know lots and lots about this. <laughs> and we were just like flabbergasted uh, and had to sort of put her in check a little bit. But maybe a better example most recently of allies that mean well but didn't do very well was when we had a dialogue opportunity with some of the leadership of the Episcopal Church in our diocese. And one of the white allies who attended basically took over the conversation at one point. And what that did was it silenced and used time that could have been used for our BIPOC voices, our black indigenous people of color voices. And then he was very patronizing at the end about um, he had the most experience and wisdom of all in the room because he was a cross-cultural communicator. <laughs> and we're like, you know what? That doesn't trump people of color voices in any way, shape or form. 